to the cloud. <coughs> okay, so, so welcome everybody who ever joined to the Java IL uh, <coughs> online uh, meetup. Uh, as as uh, some of you have noticed, uh, because of the COVID-19, we are avoiding uh, meetups uh, in Israel, as other meetup groups are doing as well. So uh, we actually uh, decided to take up on it and um, and uh, squeeze the um, let's say squeeze the, the the juice out of this lemon, and and to do that we actually started um, going into people that would normally make it, make it very hard to come to Israel to give talks. Uh, so we are actually g getting really really quality talks uh, recently because of that. And also, I think it uh, sometimes make it even more reachable to people um, because it's um, it's at night, it's at home. So people that have kids maybe make it uh, even easier. It's one minute from the living room, so make it easier to actually join uh, and learn something new. So uh, <clears throat> just a reminder, uh, a couple of reminders before we we introduce uh, Nicolas. So. Um, we have our YouTube channel and that, that includes all the talks that we are recorded uh, in the last four years. And Zoom is easy, but we also have our own cameraman that uh, records every physical uh, meetup that we have. We have really fantastic lectures there. And, and so I would really recommend uh, look at, looking at uh, that. We hold discussions on our Facebook group so when you are at work and something doesn't add up and you are contemplating on selecting um, this uh, Hazelcast or Ignite. Uh, so- uh, Just choose Hazelcast. Of course, of course. Uh, I wouldn't think otherwise. Um, so you have many, many junctions to decide on what to choose and how to use. So Facebook group is the place for you because um, people are online, people responding and quite knowledgeable people out there and uh, some of them, and it's very easy to pick up the phone and continue the discussion from this Facebook group. So uh, I would really advise you to do that and to use the Facebook group. So it's simply Java IL, search for it on Facebook and join in. The link is also in the about section of the, of the meetup.com uh, website of Java IL. Um, last, uh, last note, which is very important. We are constantly seek for uh, new lectures. So um, some, sometimes people are shy or sometimes people don't think that really they have much to say. But from our um, almost five years experience in Java IL, you do. Um, so we can help you um, to find that because usually people don't write, don't write, don't just write a, save and update and delete uh, to the database. Usually you do more than that. And usually it involves challenges. So share your challenge, share how you solved it, share your use case, and maybe share a technology that you use. It can be even, even, even an old technology, but your use case may be interesting. So please um, uh, message us on Meetup um, and we will help you uh, craft your presentation uh, and make it available to the other community members because that's the whole spirit, right? Share knowledge in, that you find uh, during a walk and make other people's work easier. So that's the administrative part. Uh, so uh, today we have uh, Nicolas Frankel, uh, which the name may confuse you. He's not from Israel. <laughs> um, so uh, Nicolas is currently um, Correct me if I'm wrong, a developer advocate, right? And Hazelcast? Yeah, true. And um, so this is the second time uh, we have Nicolas. Uh, you can find the, the lecture that is recorded. Uh, he was physically in, in Israel in the last meetup, and it was a, an amazing meetup, as you will see soon. I know it's only uh, virtual, but Nicolas is a really, really good lecture. I saw him at the first time at JDKIO, and uh, he really blends in his humor and uh, really insightful knowledge. 
So I'm really glad uh, that you decided to uh, take your time and uh, present, uh, Nicolas. And uh, without further ado, I really uh, appreciate that. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. So uh, please, hope... please mute, mute everybody. If, if you need to mute yourself, this is the time, and that's it, Nicolas. It's yours. Thanks. Um, yeah. So you raised the expectations a lot. Now I, I don't know what to say. So you introduce uh, you already introduced me. Uh, the most important characteristic of me right now is I'm stuck at home like you. I work at a company called Hazelcast. Hazelcast has two products. Our first product is an in-memory data grid. And you can think about an in-memory data grid as distributed data structures. The most used one is the hash map. So it's like you put stuff, key value, and then you get the value from the key. That's what you already do when you are using hash map in Java. The difference here is you have the same interface or a very similar one, but then the underlying implementation is distributed all over the network. Second product is Hazelcast Jet, and uh, it uses IMDG to have uh, in-memory stream processing. So we are very, very fast. Now, this talk is not about Hazelcast IMDG nor Hazelcast Jet. It's about how you create your own Kubernetes operator. So I won't present your Kubernetes. Probably, if you are not using it at work, probably you have heard of it. And basically, it's just a deployment platform for your containers. And a very high level bird's eye view of Kubernetes is this one. You have what is called the control plane and basically the control plane is managed by the API server. This is the most important piece of work here and it store everything into its database called etcd which is distributed as well. And then on all your, no, your, your nodes, you have this worker node, and then you can deploy your containers. As I mentioned, the most important piece is the Kubernetes API servlet, because uh, when you want to execute an action on, on Kubernetes, when you want to get the state of the cluster, you basically are talking to the API, to the API server. And the fun part is when you are doing that when you are using kubectl, for example. That's exactly what you are doing. So let's do it. And cube, uh, cube cattle, get pods v6. So here, I'm talking to the API server, which basically here is available at this address. And here you have a REST request. And we can see also the HTTP verb. And if you want to be a bit more detailed, you can do this. And you can see that it's really, really a, a, a REST request because basically it return you JSON. And if you do post, you will see you also send JSON. Controller in Kubernetes is very, very simple. Actually, a controller is just a control loop that watch the state of your cluster, and then depending on the state, we'll try to align the existing state to the desired state. And if you have used Kubernetes, you probably know about, for example, the deployment controller. So you can define some deployment, you set the number of replicas, you set the image, you set the version, and then you say, hey, I want this number of this image deployed and Kubernetes will try to achieve that. And if you increase or decrease this number, then you have this controller that will constantly check and increase or decrease this number. Uh, likewise, if, you, if the number is fixed, but then you manually remove a pod of this deployment, then Kubernetes will again respawn a new one just to match the desired state to what you want. Sorry, to match the existing state to what you want. A controller, I mean the controller, those I mentioned, the uh, deployment controller, the uh, stateful set, replica set, job, 
they are all located in the control plane because they are out of the box controller. They are provided to you by Kubernetes. But imagine we do our own custom controller. Basically, nothing prevents you from running a controller outside the cluster. So it can be running inside, can be running outside, all bets are off. There is no requirement. And then if you remember the first line, I struck out the word operator and I put controller. So what's the difference? Well, an operator actually is um, a controller that manage custom resources, so application-specific resources. And in Kubernetes parlance, these custom-specific uh, uh, resources are called custom resource definition. And um, you can create new objects. And if you have been using Istio or Knative, all those things, they create new objects. They create custom resource definition. And you can do that in YAML. So here, for example, this is, I would create a new object called a Hazel cost. Here you can see it's an object called Hazel cost and you can put a plural if you want or whatever you want. And it will create, it will enhance, it will improve the, the, the default model with your new objects. And then at that point, then you can use this controller to manage that custom resource. And in that way, your controller becomes an operator. And basically, if you know how to develop an operator, you know how uh, to, to develop a controller, you know how to develop an operator. The difference is that instead of managing existing resources, you will manage custom resources. So for, for the scope of this talk, we will keep at the level of the controller and then it's very easy to, to create your operator because just create your CRD and manage them. So as we saw, um, a controller is just a control loop first, and there are two requirements. It must talk to the API server, so it must be REST-based, so talk to HTTP and use JSON. So basically, if we extrapolate a bit, uh, well, you could create a controller in, in Bash, in Shell, in ZSH, in whatever language you want. So why are there so many controllers or operators in Go? Well, because Go is all over Kubernetes. And if you know about a bit about the history of Kubernetes, at first, Kubernetes was in Java. And they decided to rewrite it in Go to be closer to the machine. And I don't like Go. Well, to be honest, it's not that I don't like Go, is I find, I, I dislike it a lot. Um, I find myself, when I write Go, I tried it, I, I, didn't, I didn't pursue because it was too hard. But basically, when I, I, I tried to write Go, it, it, I felt myself like 15 years ago in Java, and even worse. It, even 15 years ago, Java was better. I mean, for me, what's easier? For example, something very stupid, exceptions. Um, I, I, when I, I learned Java, like 20 years ago, I learned that exceptions could isolate your exception and link code from your business code. So when I, I read Java code, I can read the try block and see what's the, what I'm trying to do. And then I can read the catch exception. So what should I do when this exception happened? And what should I do when this exception happened? So if I'm not concerned, if I just want to understand the business logic, I can just read the, the try block. And the problem of Go is, of course, there are no exceptions because exceptions are like evil go-tos or that's what probably um, Go developers will tell you. But uh, you have multiple written values so that if you have an exception, an error, actually, then it must be part of the written values. And so every time you have a return, then you must assign a variable to it that is the error. And every time you must check that the error is not null. And if it's, it's not null, you must do something about the error. It might be returning it. It might be managing it here. It might be anything. 
And I have a hard time reading that kind of code. Also, if, if you want to troll a bit, Go developers, you could always like uh, put this image, which is always funny. Like, yeah, every time you have the same basic template, error, and link stuff, which makes it, to me, very hard to read. Now, imagine that we want um, to use Go anyway, because, hey, that's okay. We can manage that. We are smart people. We can learn Go, and we can unlearn uh, to care about the, this stuff. But Go syntax is not that hard, actually. It's much simpler than Scala's or, or Java's or whatever. But the problem is when you switch to a new language, learning the syntax is the simplest basic building block. Um, the second step is to write the code in the language the way the language was meant to be. I remember when I started in Java, a lot of C developers and C++ developers also started Java. And you could read from the code style that it was written by a C or C++ developer. For example, I remember every time at the end of a method, they assign all local variables to null just because they wanted to make sure that the garbage collector will see, will see that this variable is now not referenced anymore. And if you switch to Go, if you are a Java developer, you must learn to write Go in the Go way, or you will write Go in the Java way, which doesn't work. Now, if you, if you reach this step, the next step is to do the libraries. You are very comfortable in Java ecosystem, the Scala ecosystem, because you know all the libraries. You know, hey, I have those logging frameworks. So for example, you can say, hey, I know that Java UT logging isn't used by no one. It's, it's very limited. So I will use um, SLF4J and the implementation will be logged back. Or I know that I will be using the new um, uh, Apache uh, Log4j2 because it's brand new and it makes for, for lazy uh, computation of parameters. This is a reflex. You, you know your ecosystem. If you switch to a new tech stack, you will need to relearn everything and probably you will make a lot of mistakes. After the libraries, then probably there is the, the tooling, like stupid questions. How do you debug stuff? How do, do you debug Go, Go code? In Java, I don't need an IDE to debug. Actually, I know, uh, I, well, I don't know, but I will Google, hey, so what, what are ex the exact parameters to, to, to launch a Java uh, process in debug mode? And then I could probably attach uh, my IDE to uh, a, a remote JVM. That's very easy. I mean, I, I don't, I know how to do it. I just don't remember the parameter, the exact parameter, but it's very easy to do that. Uh, if, if, you, if you go to a new stack, you, you will have to relearn everything. And again, VS Code, IntelliJ ID, what's the best ID to write Go code? You, you, you have no clue. So my, my advice in that case, unless you are willing to invest that much energy, that much time, that much money into learning a new stack is, if you already know how to use language X, be it Python, Scala, whatever, uh, just use it, just use it. And, and we can have a very similar result. That's what I will try to show you. And of course, uh, since I know Java and since it's a, a, a Java meetup, my point is, hey, let's do that in Java. So time for a demo. Here. I've created a very simple project uh, to have a very simple, it, it won't be a controller right now. It's, it's just, let's say, simple code, just to familiarize ourselves how it worked. So this is Java 8 because, yeah, let's not go too, too far in the future. And I have actually two dependencies. The first one is the, the Java client. So that's very good to know, um, like Kubernetes API, as I mentioned, is offered by the API server. And if you go to the Kubernetes project, all the APIs are available in many, many different flavors because it's a Swagger uh, API. And uh, so they, there is an automated generation. So there is one for Java, one for Python, one for Go, one for, you, you can check on the site. There are many, many bindings for different tech stacks. 
and, and the second one is <clears throat> actually just SLF4J because I just need to, to log stuff. And now I will try, so I, I won't code everything. I will just like use Git. This is my main class. So what this class does is I get a client and then I set the configuration to this client. And that's the problem that I have with this current API, with this Swagger binding is basically they are very, they are actually mirroring the REST API. And so that means that I am passing a lot of parameters that are null because I don't need them here. And I hate it. I really hate that, but I mean, that's how it is. And so what I'm doing right now, I will just getting the list of all pods and just print them on the console. So if I, I do that right now, good. And now if I, if I do the same here, uh, k get pods all name spaces you can see i have i have the same result this is the exact same result here i have the status which i didn't choose and the restart and the age and everything but i have the same result so that's pretty cool right well i hope you you find it pretty cool as well now, the next step would be, as I mentioned, you can deploy it outside of the cluster or inside the cluster. And because here, I want to use the benefits of, of Kubernetes just as like uh, health checks and, and, and restart if necessary and all that stuff, I, I, I want to deploy inside the cluster. Again, it's not necessary. It's just that here, in that case, I find it much, much easier. And if you hear some mewing, it's because my cat is mewing at my feet right now. So because I want to deploy it on Kubernetes, I'm using something called the jib plugin. So perhaps you know about the jib plugin. Um, it's for, for lazy Java developers like me. Um, one option would be to actually uh, create the Docker file and to uh, write everything by hand. Um, but actually, Google found out that all Java developers do the exact or nearly exact same Docker file, which um, is not a great idea because basically that could be factored into a project. That's exactly how it is done here. So this G plugin, one it is bound to the compile phase, not to the package phase. So basically I will be running not a drawer, but my classes directly and uh, um, the jib plugin will handle the class pass for me. So it will put all the classes into a specific folders, all the libs into a specific folders and it will handle the class pass. And what it will do, it will send the results of uh, the, the compile to the local Docker daemon. So by default, it will send it to your um, Docker hub, but here I don't want to add this like network, going back and forth. I just want everything to be self-contained. And uh, here um, I overrode the base image because that by default, the base image has no shell, has no nothing. So it's just the Java runtime. And if, if it has no shell so, and, and something bad happens, then it's not possible uh, to SSH into the faulty image. So um, what I would advise you is by default to always use the debug image, which has a shell. Now, the next step is to actually finally do something and to add the Kubernetes deployments. And the Kubernetes deployment is here. So because I'm a nice Kubernetes citizen, I put everything into a namespace, which will be called GVM operator. And then I will just deploy this custom operator into GMM operator. And because I'm super, super lazy, and also I played with it a bit this 
afternoon, I will be using scaffold. So scaffold, let me just like check the changes I'm doing on my code and automatically rebuild and redeploy this new image. So here for the first time, it will like watch everything and you can see that it's calling the build and it already deployed the image. And now the problem that I have is I'm forbidden to call, to call the, the API server. That's the first lesson. So I'm forbidden to, to use it. So it, it, it stops the GVM and then it, it, because the GVM is stopped, the pod is not responding. And so it, it, Kubernetes kills, kills the pod and restart a new one, which has the same problem. So that's the first lesson. When we were outside the cluster, everything went fine, but now we are inside the cluster and our pod is like any other pod. It must be given permission to talk to the API server because I mean, the API server can do everything. It can deploy new pods, it can delete pods, it can, it can do all sorts of, of stuff. And so basically I, I don't want this pod to do everything. I want this pod here just to list other pods. So I, I will just give it this exact permission. And I mean, it, it's, it's very easy to say the, it, it's a bit harder to do. So let's do it. And after I will show you, so now with the new permission, it has already, and now it works. So I, I show you the permission code. It's, it's not fun, really, it's not fun. Um, it's the same namespace. And I create something called the, called the cluster role. And basically I said that this cluster role is able to list pods. And so basically I'm, I'm using the list privilege principle because I want my pods to list pods then I say, you can only list pods. If I want to do more, of course, I will give more, but I, I limit the, the permissions to be to the smallest scope possible. And then once I've done that, I create a service account and then I bind the service account to the cluster role. And so basically this cluster role binding as the name, um, <clears throat> as the name operator uh, service and now that it's done I can set sorry um, I can set it here to the service account name operator service so now I'm able to say that this GVM operator is able to list pods going through the cluster role binding I still have an issue in my code is that here I still have the same problem. My, my GVM starts, does its work and stops. And afterwards, Kubernetes say, hey, are you up? No, you are, you, are, you are not up, you're probably down. So I will kill you and I will start a new pod. And it goes and goes and goes. And every time you see it will have a rest, one more restart. It's, it's not a great idea. Um, so though it's doing its job, we are, not, we are not doing very good for that. So what we will just add is basically a, a stupid loop. So now my list pods as a stupid loop and, and because we, we don't want everything to be printed out all, all the time, but just like one per second, which is already a good thing. So now the, the console output is the same. Let's do it like this. So everything is nicely aligned, yes. And but the good thing is now is finally we have we have it ready. So, so that's the first thing that we managed to do. So we have created a small control. Well, it's not a controller yet because I mean it, it's only like reading stuff. It doesn't act at all. But it's an embryo of let's say a, a, a controller, and, and it has the right permission, and it works. And, and, and it, it works on the GVM, which is, I believe, pretty cool. And if we, if we check the Docker images, grab GVM, we see it here. And we see that it's, it's, it's 200 megs for just 
reading the 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 the, the pods, which, which which is a bit much, of course. So we will try to get um, much lower afterwards, but we still have a lot of work to do. The next step is to do some watching. Right now, what we are doing is we are pulling every time. And of course, pulling is the worst you can do because if you pull too often, then you will have the same data, which is happening here because actually we are not deploying any new ports. So every time it gives us the same data over and over. And we, if we don't pull fast enough, then we will miss changes. We will miss stuff that are not uh, are, are, are happen between two poles. So we will do some watch instead. And here, this is the watch API. Again, it's very close to the to the Swagger API, which I don't like, but again, same problem. And here you see that it deployed a new version. Um, and then I, er, I, I have everything here. And you can see that I also have myself. And now if I add a new, uh, let's say here, uh, where is it here? I, I deploy a new, Not nope, this one here. I deploy a new deployment. Here I will deploy a new deployment. You can see that it was heading here. K get parts. It's running there. It has the same name. So basically I'm aware of that. And now if I K delete deployment has a cost. Now I have modification and at some point in time, it will tell me, hey, this pod has been deleted. So perhaps I can delete it. So it's much, much better. There are actually- so wait. How, how, did you, how did you implement the, the reverse section of Paul? Uh, there is no reverse action of all. Actually, I, I'm using the watch API. So this is this, this line. And this is part of the Kubernetes client API? Yes, this is part of the Kubernetes client API. Okay. And actually, what I didn't mention, because Scaffold took care of it, uh, now you have a new permission because the listing is not the same as watching. Polling is not the same as subscribing. So you, you, you need to know where, or if you don't know, probably what will happen is you will deploy it and it will break. It will tell you, hey, you don't have permission. So um, that's, that's what happened to me. Um, you, you need to add this new verb, which actually is not a real HTTP verb, but here it says that it's a verb. There is another way to do that. So um, instead, we can use a, another, an alternate uh, watcher API. And it looks like the following. So before, it was, it was a callback. Here, now, we are using a real event handler. We are using a real event handler. And that's much closer to actually subscribing. And you see that this event handler like handles edits, handles update, handles delete. The authorization didn't change though, because it's still watching. Still, it has a lot of null fields. Ugh. Yeah, I, I, I dislike it. Um, it's essentially the, behind the scenes, it's, it's a. Um... It's a simple, it's a, it's a request that uh, the response is a never ending response? Yes, actually, yes. So I don't know if it's long polling or if it's using WebSocket or whatever. I just know that in the end, um, it looks for me like if I'm subscribing to something and I get triggered when something happens, which is exactly what I want. 
Now, next step. Next step is I want actually to try now finally to do some control because now, since now I am aware of events, I can trigger some stuff. And what I will be doing in that talk is, is to try to implement the sidecar pattern. So basically the sidecar pattern is a pattern in, in Kubernetes where you say, hey, when this happens and probably this is when I deploy a pod, then I will deploy another pod. So for example, you can do this with Istio when you deploy a pod and you have the Istio in Kubernetes, then you will deploy a new pod which will serve as a proxy for all network, networking stuff. So that's exactly what I want to do. I don't want to go further. And basically what I want to do is when I deploy a pod, I want to deploy a Hazelcast pod. So you can be smart saying, hey, I want to deploy a pod only when I have this annotation Hazelcast or whatever. Uh, here, I, I, I want to be very simple. So let's implement it. So first, fun stuff, I need to be able to create and delete pods. And those are two very important, very, very important permissions. So I need to, 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 to do that. Uh, and I have my sidecar event handler. And this sidecar event handler, so when I add, I check that if I add something into the GVM operator namespace, and if what I deploy is not itself a sidecar, if I forget that, that means that I will deploy one pod, it will deploy the sidecar, the sidecar will be deployed, so there will be a new event that is triggered. So it will deploy a sidecar to the sidecar and it will never stop. Well, actually it stops because at some points, um, I think it's limited by the number of characters. I will get the name of this pod. I will check that it has no sidecar yet. And if it has no sidecar, I will create a sidecar and creating a sidecar is actually Again, very, very close to the Swagger API. So I create a container, blah, blah, blah. I take data from the existing pods. I take data from the namespace and I create that. Let's see how it works. Now we see that I developed something. So it says, hey, no sidecar found for pod custom div operator creating one. And so we only deployed one pod. Now we have two pods. Amazing. Amazing. So through the API, we actually were able to start doing a control loop. On updates does nothing. And on delete should remove the sidecar. Let's try it. So I will stop scaffold because at this point, I think it's not working that well. I will deploy it by hand and check how that works. I'm in the, mm, nope. Nicolas, I saw uh, someone then noticed that uh, you're back in time and you have uh, containers from 50 years ago. Yes. <laughs> you see, you see th those people who ask like uh, f five years of, of, of um, React experience. I, I am very good. So I started Kubernetes 50 years ago. No, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good comment, actually. Um, if you are using uh, the Jib plugin, by default, it, will don't, it, it, won't handle the, it won't handle the timestamp. And so by default, the timestamp will be 50 years ago, which basically probably will be the first January of, of 17. It will be epoch yeah. time. <laughs> Um, because it, tri it tries to have like um, repeatable builds. And if you use the timestamp, then you won't have the, the repeatable build. So yes, that's, that's a good comment. Um, so I will, I will deploy it by hand here. Uh, K apply F authorization. I need the authorization and then I need to do the deployment as well. Yeah, deploy. 
Okay, now I will check. K okay, get pods, 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 pods. So everything is fine. And now what I want to do is I want to remove this one. And normally, because I'm I'm deleting it, then it should it should handle the removing of the of the of the sidecar. So if I if I remove the pod, it will remove the sidecar. Okay, uh, delete pod custom operator. Okay, get pods. Okay, get pods. Okay, get pods. Okay, get pods. It didn't remove it, so I I, I feel it's not great. Um, the problem is when it has been removed, there is no code to execute the on delete. So that's not the right approach, actually. Uh, key delete pod has of costs, customer operator. So what we want to do instead is to use something called the ownership. And the ownership means that basically instead of trying to delete something by ourselves, we will just say, hey, this pod is owned by this pod. So when you remove this pod, this one should be removed as well. And you don't need to do anything about it. It's just that Kubernetes will handle it directly. So let's do it. Okay, get pods. Now we will remove the customer operator. No, okay, delete. Delete, pod, custom operator. Takes a bit of time because yeah, there is some cleanup involved and K get pods and it has been removed automatically. So the ownership is the right way to go. Now what we didn't do is basically, what if we remove the sidecar? We want a new sidecar to be spawned and we didn't handle it. So because on on delete, we should do something. On delete means not if we remove the owner. What if we remove the sidecar? If we remove the sidecar, we should spawn a new sidecar. So that's the real problem with when, when, when you create a controller is, it's, is to think about all the events, what the user can do and what we sh you, you should do to uh, put that into the same state as before. Using the API is quite easy actually. So here we say, if it's an, a sidecar of a pod, the, uh, if, sorry, if um, this pod is a sidecar assigned to another pod, then, we will recreate one that looks like the first one. So of course it's deleted, but we create a new one anyway. So here let's write k get pods. No, I didn't apply it. So let's apply it. K get pods. K get pods. Now we, we remove this one. You can see there is one second of edge gap between both. Yay, delete pod this one. So now Kubernetes will delete it because, well, I asked it to delete it, but then our controller will spawn a new one. And see, there are 24 seconds because basically it was removed, it was deleted, and, and we, it was automatically created by our controller. And, and that's it, that's, that's a controller but we can do better. So now we have a working running controller. It's really cool, but we can do better. The first stuff that I mentioned since the beginning is I hate this API. This API is too level. It's too close to the rest API. I hate that. I mean, I have to, to, to write this kind of code, which I really, really hate. I, I, I hate that. I mean, now I, I know there is a controller, now I have a spec, and now I have the owner here and met, I mean, it's, it's unreadable. It's unreadable and even if I, I mean, 
I cannot make it smaller than 10 lines of code because that's just the code. I cannot have building blocks. Here is just create a sidecar, for God's sake. So it's, it's very hard. Um, so instead of using this API, I will use another API. I will use something called the, the Fabricate API. And this API is actually not provided by Kubernetes. It has the same concept, but it is Java native. So you can see, sorry, here that it looks much, much better. And the side called Watcher is also much, much better. There is a bit of a difference. It's basically you have one method and inside you must check whether it's added or deleted or whatever. But for our sake, it's the same. We still have the create sidecar. Now, create sidecar, we have this new API. To be honest, yes, it might look a bit shitty, but if you have doing, uh, been doing any YAML and with a bit of formatting, you can check that it's completely mirroring your YAML. Metadata, name, namespace, owner, reference, API, blah, blah, blah. So if you apply the correct formatting, you can check that it's the same as a YAML file. And I believe that it's much, much better to look at. It's a Fluent API, so you have this with stuff. I, I prefer it a lot, really, really a lot. And uh, if, you, if you see that it's a sidecar, it's much more readable. If already as a sidecar, you can uh, use a one-liner using Java 8 streams because it's so cool to use streams. And, and there is, it looks much more Java-ish. What, what I, I, I dislike with the, 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 the official API, it's, it's very restless, rest-like. And here you have something that is for Java developers. So let, let's, let's try it. Of course, I expect to have the same. Okay, get pods. Yes, I have the same. Great. K delete pod just to check that it still will create a new sidecar. If I delete the sidecar, yes, everything is good. K delete custom operator, custom operator, pod custom operator. Good. Now, guys, we, are, we have an issue because our image so the Fabric 8 uh, Docker images, the Fabric 8 image is the 1.9. It's this one. So it's 180 megs. It does the job, but it's a bit huge. Also, the problem with the GVM is that it's very, very good for long running processes. Um, because if, if, you, if you do a long running GVM process, then the GVM can adapt the native code to the workload. So when you deploy, you deploy bytecode, and then the GVM does its black magic, transforming bytecode to native code. And the way it does it is to, like, to have the best, best performances according to the workload. That's good. But if we have something that spins on, runs for two minutes, and again gets killed afterwards for whatever reason, then it's not really great. And we are expecting Kubernetes to regularly kill our containers. And so the benefits of, of using the GVM are not that huge. Also, for that, for that reason, the GVM uh, uses a lot of memory. So if we have long running processes, that's fine. If we have short running processes, that's not that fine. And it will take too much memory. And if you are used to the cloud, probably you are paying for the memory, which is not super great. So if I tell you about Java, how to make a native executable, then you will probably think about GraalVM. 
Are there any people already familiar with Grohl VM? Any feedback? Yes, you are familiar or no, you don't know nothing about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so everything can, that is written on the slide you already know. No, Sorry? you can zoom. Only Uri answered, but... Can... <laughs> okay. This, this, is okay. What, this is what for the joke. <laughs> so, um, so Graal VM, the problem of Graal VM is that it's a big bag of stuff. Um, and it can do a lot of different unrelated features. The first thing is um, with, with Graal VM, you, you have um, like GVM specific implementation of existing languages. So you have, you have uh, JavaScript, you have uh, Python, you have R, you have Ruby, um, and it allows you to uh, embed uh, JavaScript into your Java programs, for example. So the, the first thing of, of GraalVM is, is you, you can use Polyglot. Um, the second is, is you have the Truffle framework, which is used by the JavaScript and R implementation, for example. And, and that Truffle framework allows you to write your own language that will be running on the GVM. Or to use an existing language, I don't know. You can, use, uh, you can say, hey, I will cre create Truffle Elixir. So you can create Truffle Elixir, and then you, you, you can run Elixir on the GVM. That would be so cool. And the third thing, which is the one that is of interest to us, is you can create a native executable out of byte code. And that is the most important. That means that we completely remove the GVM. In the end, it will be a native executable. And of course, in order to do that, you will have some compilation, but it won't be runtime compilation. It will be ahead of time compilation. So our uh, Substrate VM compiler will try to execute the bytecode and try to follow every path. And by doing that, once it has followed every path, and compile everything, only the paths that were being followed will have been compiled. Meaning if you are not using an API, it won't be compiled. So that in the end, you will have a very, very limited set of the GVM. That has a lot of benefits, but it has also a lot of issues. A lot of benefit, for example, here, I probably am not using any XML parsing. There won't be any XML parsing in, in the final executor. On the other way, that means that if the, if the compiler, if the Graal compiler is not able to follow a path, probably because you were using reflection, then it won't be in the final executable. And so your program will fail at runtime, which is what you don't want. So because the developers are aware of that, the developers of Grub are aware of that, they allow you to configure the JSON. So you, you can provide a JSON file that will say, hey, you must keep this and 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 this. So the process would be, I will, Writes the whole configuration of JSON, and I will compile my jar with this configuration. And so now the 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 the, the, the compiler will know. Hey, this I must keep. So even if there is no pass, I will still follow this pass. As you can imagine, for any non-trivial program, this JSON file might be huge. And so it's not um, very feasible. So there is an agent that allows you, and I will show you how it works, um, to basically record everything into such JSON file at runtime. So now if I go here, 
And now I remove, I remove jip. I have, I, I have to create a Docker file, a real Docker file. And I will use an agent. And basically this agent will write the configuration into this Graal VM config folder. And what I just need to do is to get this Graal VM config folder, get its content and put it into my own folder. But before I do that, I must launch the program and myself go to every feature, to every nook and cranny. So basically here in that case, I must deploy a new pod, remove the pod, update a new pod, do a lot, everything, so that it's able to record every path and write the, co the most complete JSON file. And afterwards, I will have this kind of file. And so you, it works also with GNI, with proxy, with the resources. But here, the one that is the most interesting is the one from reflection. And you can see that if you want to write that by hand, it's not going to be very fun and probably you will forget something. So here, it's something that was created at runtime because I launched this huge, huge, and I can show you how huge that is, this GVM operator 2.0. 2.0 is the whole stuff. It's one gigs dot three. It's huge, really. But then I deploy it, I use it, I get the content of all JSON file. And now finally, I'm able to create my native image. Native image now is a bit more complex. The first thing is when you create a native executable, it's not cross-platform. So I cannot, hey, so it's not cross-platform. So I, I cannot try to, to use this Docker file in my, in my Mac, on my Mac, and, 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 and do it on top of my Mac because it will create a Mac executable. Then I will deploy it to a Kubernetes and it tell me, hey, it doesn't work. It's not compatible. So that doesn't work that well. Three steps. The first step, I'm creating the jar and it will be an Uber jar. The second step is I'm creating the native executable. And the third step is I'm using this native executable. I put it on top of Alpine Jlib. I add the necessary libraries and I can run it. Let's see how it works. So now this is version 2.1. Uh, so I hope I'm on version 2.1. Yes, normally I should be, yes. Just to add uh, the context and let know if most people know it. It's uh, we're talking about a multi-step Docker file. Yes, it's sorry uh, for me that was self-evident. Who is not familiar with multi-step Docker files? Sorry, yeah, that's a good comment. Let's presume people don't know it because people don't answer. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's fine. So imagine you 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 want to uh, be able uh, to have a Docker file that you want to build your stuff on. Uh, and so if you are if you are running the GVM, you would say, hey, okay, I use I use an image with with um, with Maven. So you build your image, but in the end, in the end image, you will have Maven embedded in your container. So that's additional stuff that you don't want. Worse, it can be it can increase the attack surface of your container. So we, we don't want that. Um, in, in order to cope with that, there is this multi-stage Docker build file that allows you to have different steps. Every step can inherit from a different image and you can get files from one step to the next step by referencing it. So here, for example, I have the first step and I'm using a, a, a Maven image and I will call it build. And in my second step, which will be my native compilation, I say, hey, from the, this, 
step, you will copy this jar into this GVM, uh, into this, sorry, in this image. So I'm, I'm using the jar that was created in the build step in the native step. In the native step, I will be creating the native executable out of the jar. And basically it will be in this location. And so in the last step where basically I, I don't need Maven anymore, I don't need the native, ex I, I don't need GraalVM anymore. I say, okay, from the previous step, I just copy the artifacts to something called operator. And so I, I, I forget to also copy the necessary libraries. And also I also add this library and then everything is fine. And so into this image, I have a very small base image that has no Maven, that has no GVM, that has no Grawl VM. And I just have the executable, the required libraries, and that's all. And so this image is actually much, much better. 60 megs. 60 megs is actually not super great. Probably with Go, you could be a bit it's smaller, but it's, it, it, it's not really huge. It's acceptable. It's at a, the, 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 um, it's at a um, place where it's acceptable and also for networking and everything, it's acceptable. Does that answer the question that was not, <laughs> that was not asked? Asaf, since you, you were the one asking the question, does it make it clearer? Does my, my answer is clear? Um, yes, yes, very much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, and that's a good question. So if something is not clear, or if I assume something, that please let me know. That's, that, that's, I, I'm here for that. Um, and now I can, I can try to um, cube up, uh, K apply F employ. It's super fast. Get pods. It's really super fast. Now I can, it has the same feature as before, but everything is good. Now, I was very fast and you saw that, for example, this, I didn't mention it. You see that there is a library which is called OKHTTP OK Growl Fix. And actually I had to create it by myself and it's here available. That's the problem with some libraries. Some libraries, they are not super uh, friendly to Graal VM, uh, and they are trying to do code, for example, in, in, in static blocks, they are trying to execute code. And in a GVM, the static block would be executed at runtime when you load the class. But here, because of this compiler is ahead of time compil compilation process, then it gets executed during compile time. And if something is not available or uh, doesn't work, then you are done and it's not that great. And here it's exactly the issue is I have, uh, I'm using this okay HTTP library, not by myself. I didn't want to do it. It's just that, sorry, Fabricate uses it. And so because it uses it, I need it to be compatible. And I had to get the source code and to change the code and to rebuild the jar in a way that was compatible. However, this was the, the, the reason was it was a car set. So I don't remember if I found it. I will check it here. Check out. And it should be called utils. Uh, okay, HTTP internal utils, yes. This is the, the, the class that was not compatible. And here you can see that I have a private static final member and it does a corset for name. So basically when I'm doing the ahead of time compilation, I will be executing this. And when I execute this, it doesn't work. 
because this car set and this car set actually they are not available that's not great another way to cope with that in that case in that specific case is to compile with this parameter add all corsets fine i mean i can deploy it it's it works that's fine or you you, you want, do you want me do you want to trust me or should i show you that it works both are acceptable answers we, we trust you uh, nicolas well you are wrong but that's fine uh, <laughs> okay now in that case it works so that's that's another way to cope with it um, what we can do to improve also, so instead of, of every time we pass that to, to the Docker file, all those parameters, which are not very fun, um, what we can do is we can use a specific folder. So um, GraalVM is allowed to uh, use this specific folder. So meta-inf, native image, and then your package name. And then because uh, or your artifact name, I don't remember. So instead of having a, a, like an external folder, it can be part of your deliverable. That's very good if you are using libraries. If you are providing a library, for example, you can, as your library, you can be uh, like, let's say, GraalVM friendly so that people who are using your library, when you, they, they are doing ahead of time compilation, those files will, will, will be found by GraalVM and basically it will use it to native compile your library in the way you intended. So if you have reflection call and this stuff, it's, it's a good way. Uh, Nicolas, I think yes. uh, maybe um, one question that uh, yes. might be good. I don't know if it's the, the, the exact point that this question is good. Um, we haven't talked about one thing about Kubernetes operator, uh, which is, I think, sh maybe um, is the root cause for, for it all. What is the motivation for people to write operators? Like, what is the problem that uh, people are trying to solve um, when they would write operator for use case, maybe? As I mentioned, a, a, a controller, not operator, but the controller is just a control loop. Oh, it's just a control loop. Um, so most vendors, they tell you, hey, look, you want to create a deployment. And so they give you a huge list of YAML, like it might be 100 or 200 lines of YAML, because you need also to wave in the configuration for the specific product. Now, if you create an operator or controller, what you can do is you can simplify this YAML and all are, are only interested in the thing that you want. For example, for Hazelcast, we have a, a very simple uh, Hazelcast controller or operator in that case, because we, we are using a CRD. And in 20 lines of YAML, you can express everything, especially things that are only specific to Hazelcast. So in this, in this YAML, you actually say, I want uh, to run this specific, uh, Im this specific um, uh, image, let's say, yes. uh, which is the Hazelcast operator. And then- No, you, you don't want to set the image. What you will be saying is, you will be saying, hey, I want, so instead, for example, here, instead of having kind port, you will ha be having Hazel costs uh, pot. And then you will have specific stuff that are only understood by our controller. Oh, so you install, um, you install the image, the Hazel cost image separately. And yes. then so you, you want to, you want yes. to use it, like deploy Hazel cost cluster, for example. Yes. Um, or Jet you would uh, deploy this resource, exactly. which is a small YAML defining this resource. So you will, you will create, well, you will create, we will provide you with a CRD for our controller. And you will apply this CRD. So it will create a new Hazelcast pod, for example, or Hazelcast cluster. Let's say Hazelcast cluster. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, hey, I want 
five replicas and I want this network to be used. And, and, and this is very specific to Hazel costs. Mm -hmm. So you can do it by, uh, I, I, I don't know if you have seen that already, um, but you, you, can, you can put like JSON into YAML. And so no. it, it, okay. because it, it's, it, at some point it becomes a huge mess or you can reference JSON or, or whatever. I mean, it, it becomes a huge mess. But with, with um, operators, you can reduce the cognitive load on your user by only providing them configuration points where it's necessary and you handle all the rest. So for example, you can also have um, like um, say a Kafka operator. Uh, there is a Kafka operator, by the way, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what, what I mentioned. Every, every vendor tries to provide its own head up of operator because um, we want to be nice to, to operational people and we don't want them to copy paste 200 lines of YAML. So we want them to only copy paste what they can understand. Because if you if pro provide them with 200 lines of YAML, it will be very hard for them to know which line are relevant to their use case or which line are set in stone. And is that, does this operators usually come bundled with a web UI or is it a... No, well, if it, it depends. I mean, operators, they are just YAML. So basically you have, uh, if you are using Hazelcast, you have a hem chart for Hazelcast operator. So you, you use the, I, I never use the helm, to be honest, because I, I think that's, I mean, all those tools around YAML, I had them by default. I think that's the wrong model. Huh? You are not a DevOps developer. You are, you are well, you are not DevOps, you are a, a YAML user. So I hate that. I mean, anyway, um, the, this, this stuff is meant to ease the work, to ease the cognitive load of, of DevOps users. Okay. And underneath, it will either use an existing controller or have the, our own controller. Like for, for Hazelcast, to be honest, I don't know if we have a dedicated Hazelcast cluster controller or if we are using deployment or stateful sets, but you should probably be using deployment anyway. So what is, is there any um, difference? What is, what is the difference if you say between an operator and a stateful set? That's completely different. Okay, can like, you explain? As I mentioned, uh, sorry? Can you explain? Yeah, an operator is a controller that works on a CRD, but it's basically a control loop and you can do anything. Stateful set is a specific controller and it handles only pods that are meant to have an ID and cannot be replaced with one another. So like stateful set is a kind of controller, is a specific controller. And it is, is, so this is a controller for a specific element in the general use case YAML file that for when you deploy to Kubernetes. So it doesn't have its own custom resources, right? St stateful set is an object that tells you that every pod inside the stateful set must keep its ID. They, you, you know, like in, in the general case uh, for deployment or for replica sets, all pods, they are stateless. They can be replaced, they can be killed. You can replace one with another. Nobody cares. Stateful set, as the name imply, is a set of pods that are stateful. So you cannot replace them with one another. They have an ID and they cannot be replaced by one another. This is an object. And then in the control plane, you have, I don't know the name, but I know there is one that is called deployment controller. That is a control loop that will check the state of deployments and pods. And as I mentioned, if, you, if your deployment has, let's say, five replica, uh, five pods, and you remove one, then it will create 
an additional one to keep your number up to five. If you add one and then you remove it. So this is this kind of control loop that you want to implement. This is what a controller does. So you have a deployment controller, you probably have a replica set controller, you probably have a stateful set controller. So, so stateful set is about if one pod in the set vanishes, it, it will start a new one, but give it the exact same idea that you should, that you yeah, use. I, I, let, let's not talk about stateful set because we are waving this set of state, which is not relevant to the discussion at end. Let's, I okay. prefer to talk about deployment because deployment, it's much easier to, to understand. Basically, you have a pool of X pods and the deployment controller will make sure that every time X changes to something else, it will have X in the end of its run. Okay, so maybe an, another question that um, again I'm feeding from the chat. So, if someone wants to deploy, let's say let's take a database for example, like MongoDB, mm -hmm. and he say is 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 contemplating should I use a Mongo operator, okay, to deploy MongoDB, or should I use state or set? So, what would be your answer? Um, you really like stateful sets, but okay. Uh, the thing, as I mentioned, if you are using the generic object, probably it will be the same. But the problem is that it will be very, very, very long. And for example, I don't know, I, I don't know um, MongoDB, but for example, if you want to deploy um, Hazelcast on a specific port, it, it is very Hazelcast specific. And probably the YAML for this resource of hazel costs, this CRD, allows you to set the port. If you want to use the general YAML stuff, you will either need to provide it in JSON inside or to point to an external file, which again increases the cognitive load. So essentially you, you, you can achieve, it's, like yes. it's a superset. So the operator allows you to achieve anything that a set for set would allow you to achieve. Again, I, I think that we are focusing on stateful set, which I don't like. Okay. Uh, we should be more generic. We should say that controllers and operators are specialized ways, so allow you to write less YAML. Okay. And to be specific to the object that you are using. If you are using Hazelcast, you will have um, ways to configure Hazelcast and not only Kubernetes stuff, and if you are using Mongo, likewise, or Kafka, likewise. Okay. So it allows you to be, I mean, it allows for users to be more concise in their definition and to focus on the object they are using. Okay. Moshe, I hope it was, uh, oh. Uh, Moshe and uh, Mati, I hope it answered your questions. Okay, let's uh, continue. <laughs> okay, so um, the last before is to use, um, like um, in, in the previous image, what I did is I added the libraries, but basically what we can do is what we, we can uh, directly um, create like a complete uh, image, which is not a uh, complete, sorry, executable, which is not dependent on library. So we can statically compile the library into the executable, which allows you to do this kind of stuff. So in the end, we don't need to add the libraries and very important, we can add from scratch. And that's very cool. That means that we have nothing, no shell, no nothing just the executable inside the container. So this is this image, this 2.4. So 47, 47 megs. We shaved off again, like nearly 15 megs. The final step is in order, because we are right now, what we are still doing, we are, we are still adding all core sets. And basically, there are a lot of core sets that we won't use. So the, the final step is
actually provides a dedicated class that will override the one from OKHTTP where we don't have the stuff that we don't want. And this is by adding in the POM these substrate VM. So at compile time, we'll be adding additional codes that will replace the code from the jar. And this one doesn't work. <laughs> For whatever reason, I don't know why, I still have to find out by myself or to a pond bug. This one doesn't work, and I don't know why. Um, but you can say, hey, here, this class will be replacing this class. And for example, we say here that this UTF bomb is an alias for the one that exists in util point class. And here we say, hey, instead of having this util class that use this bomb aware core set where it's used here, so I will be using that util, nope, and libraries, yes. Because basically this, the one that causes issues is this one. And it is used in this class, in this, sorry. In this method. So basically if we remove that, that would be cool. That would be much easier. And that's what I'm doing here. And then afterwards, I could remove the UTF-32. And that's what I, I, I cannot do right at the moment because it doesn't work. Because once they are, they are not reference anymore, then everything is fine. So th this last step, unfortunately, doesn't work for me. But this is very specific to the problem at hand, which is, hey, I have GraalVM. I make a native executable. But one of the library is not ahead of time compilation friendly. If you, if you know a, a lot about GraalVM, if, you, if you're able to, to send me a PR, I, I, ah, I would be very, very happy. Otherwise, I will need to open a bug. And that, that's done. So in this talk, I, I told you um, like what are controllers, like basically stupid control loops that check against the existing state and try to reconcile the existing state with the desired state. Uh, we saw that operators are just controllers that operate on CRDs. We saw that there is no requirements, no tech stack, no Go, no nothing, just HTTP and JSON, basically REST. Uh, I love Java, or at least I love the GVM. So if you want to create your own controller, your own operator, and you are at ease with the GVM and you don't have time to invest in learning Go or anything else, well, just use it. And afterwards, if you want to improve um, the performance, the image size, just create a native executable using GraalVM. And thanks for your attention. Um, you can read my blog, of course, where I publish weekly blog posts. You can follow me on Twitter, that's always nice. And um, if you are interested in a code uh, and you want to try out by yourself, then you can use this link. It's on GitHub, it's public, create issues, give me feedback, I will be very happy to. And okay. that's a wrap. Uh, thanks a lot, Nicolas. I think it was a really, really a good lecture. Uh, it was a bit long. We lost a lot of people. <laughs> For, you know, it's late, so um, I know. It's, uh, it makes sense. And we also, I think it was good because we also learned not just about Kubernetes operators, because I think which is a really fascinating pattern. Also about a little bit about GraalVM, a little bit about the G plugin. So we covered like uh, other areas. I think it's a good time for uh, for people to unmute themselves and, and feel free to ask any questions you have. Yes, uh, it's about time. About this issue and about anything you want. Hi, Nikos. Uh, Hello. Thanks for you.
thanks for lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, so I have a question. Is like um, if you deploy a, your a Kubernetes operator, you want to ensure that it is always up and running. How we yes. can do it? And v very easily, actually. So instead of deploying it as a pod, you deploy it inside the deployment. You say, I want to have X replicas, and then you are done. Okay, so Kubernetes will treat, like, will handle, and then. That, that's, that, as I mentioned, the controller can be deployed outside of your cluster, can be deployed inside your cluster. That's not the, the, that's not the core feature of, of a controller. Controller is just a control loop. How you deploy it, it's your problem. And of course, you can benefit from running inside your cluster and all benefits of Kubernetes, then in that case. In that case, be aware, however, that you need to have the permissions to talk to the API server doing what you want to do. If you want to create pods, then your pod needs to have the permission to create pods. Otherwise, everything goes. So you can deploy it as a deployment, as a, a replica set, uh, well, whatever you want. Yes, and if I deploy it inside the cluster, uh, should I give the permissions to access uh, different namespaces or? That's up to you. To run? That, okay. That's up to you. That's, a, 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 that's what do, does your controller wants to do? I don't know. So you, you need to give the relevant permission. Here, in my, in my case, I said, oh, you should be only doing stuff in the GVM operator namespace. Okay. So normally I should only give it permission to do that, but sorry, depending on your use case, you might be wanting to manage every, every namespace or only a single one or whatever. It's, it's up to you. You can, you can be um, like, it can be configured. So you can say, oh, I, I, like when I deploy it, I will give it permission only to uh, work into this uh, namespace. That's fine too. Okay, cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Let's answer my question. Are the questions? Will you be able to share the presentation, uh, Nicolas, on, on the meet? Yes, I will. Definitely. Comment? Yes. Thank you. Yes. I will tweet it. So be 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 <laughs> be sure to follow me on Twitter. I am, but uh, yeah, uh, it is a you will be cheating then. Thank you. Other questions? Or it's time for you to do non geeky stuff and to care about yourself and your family? Like writing code? Sorry? Like, like writing code? Ah, if you are if you are writing code, it's it's very geeky. Yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot, thanks everybody, and uh, well, I hope I will be able to meet you in person soon when that shit is over, or at least has decreased in intensity. And uh, until then, then take care, and see you. Okay, thank you thanks Nicholas. very much. Thank you. thank you very much. Bye Safe bye. Travels back home, Nicholas. Sorry. Safe travel back home. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm in Japan right now. I need to fly. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.